stewardship. And since 2002, the Tree Fund awarded over $4.4 million of our research and education grants. So a lot has gone into tree research. Uh, to see all of the research that has been funded throughout the years, you should go to the research archives page at thetreefund.org. And you can search for a scientific name of a tree, or you can search for a topic, and you can find a complete list of research projects that have been funded. Um, and then after exploring the research archives, you can also find other information about the Tree Fund on the website, including the upcoming webinar schedule and the archives with the past webinars where you can click on the links and watch those on YouTube. So without further ado, today we have Bryant Scherenbrock. He is the Assistant Professor of Soil Science at the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. And he is a research fellow of, of sorry, and a research fellow of Center for Tree Science and the Morton Arboretum. Bryant has his PhD in soil science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, master's in science in plant science from the University of Idaho, and a bachelor's of science in, from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point uh, in urban forestry and forest management. Bryant's research interests are pedology and soil quality, and Bryant has published over 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. He has presented over 200 times at industry and scientific conferences and has served as the chair of the Urban and Anthropogenic Soils Division of the Soil Science Society of America and as the associate editor for the Arboriculture and Urban Forestry magazine. So he has done a lot and he's here to share our knowledge and Take it away, Ryan. I will stop sharing my screen. Oops. It didn't give me the option to stop sharing my screen. No worries. Um, it's at the bottom where there's a green there little is. box. Yeah. Got it. All right, it's Brian's turn. Okay. All right, can everyone hear me? Is that working? We can hear you. Can't see you, your, your screen quite yet. It might have popped up. That interstitial window might have popped up somewhere, and it's just not. You cannot, you cannot see it? Not yet. So do you see that green share screen button? I do. OK, click it, and then there will be that interstitial window that pops up. And you can select you want to share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. And now I can see, there we go, perfect. Okay, good. All right, are we ready to go? Ready to rock. All right, well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. I'd like to start by thanking the Tree Fund for inviting me to do this webinar and for funding much of the research that we do on this topic. Thanks to Utah State Extension for helping, out, helping put on the webinar. Today, I will be talking about soil assessment for urban trees. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to send them via the chat and we'll discuss them at the end of the webinar. I have two objectives for today's webinar. The first is to understand how soil quality is determined and the second is to discuss how soil quality be, can be utilized for urban tree care. Much of the material in today's webinar is covered in this best management practice. The BMP on soil management for urban trees is available through the International Society of Arboriculture. We're currently working on a revision of this BMP. So if you have any ideas, comments, or questions, that you think might make valuable inclusions for the revision, I'd appreciate if you would send them to me. Soil management for urban trees is much more than the actions we might perform to try and correct a particular soil problem. A proper soil management plan or approach involves four steps. The first step is aiming or setting the goal. The second, assessing, which involves determining the specific problem is what I'll focus a lot of today's attention to. The actions are the specific things we might perform to correct that problem. And lastly, 
we, we need to analyze or evaluate whether or not the actions we performed will help us meet the goal. And that, that again involves assessment. Today we'll focus on a critical step of soil management for urban trees, which is assessment. Specifically, we will cover why, when, where, how to assess soils, and then we'll talk, of, talk how we can use that information for urban tree care. We will cover some soil sampling considerations. We will also discuss some important physical, chemical, and biological soil properties that we might use in soil assessment. Let's start with why we need to assess urban soils. I can think of at least two reasons why we might need to assess urban soils. First, we know that soils are important for urban tree health. Second, we have very little site-specific information that we can use for urban trees. We feel a proper site assessment for urban trees will have two major benefits. First, it will allow us to better match species to sites which will lead to a wider range of species planted in urban areas. Second, it will give us a tool to determine if our management actions to improve soils are actually working. I will, I will elaborate a bit more on each of these two points. First, in regards to why soil assessment is important for urban forestry. Urban tree hardiness varies and so does urban site quality. Putting the right trees in the right site will allow for more diverse and healthy urban forests. Soil assessment is a critical component of that goal. Weak trees in poor sites are expensive to maintain and may be short-lived. Instead, we should plant tough trees on these low quality sites. Tough trees will also grow in good sites, but this is inefficient planning. Good sites are areas that we should use to increase urban forest diversity by trying new species. By this approach, we might work to maximize urban species diversity and overall urban forest health. The second major application of an urban site index would be as a tool to monitor our management actions for improving soil quality. So often we are attempting to fix soils but are we properly investigating soils prior to and following these management actions to ensure that we are doing what is necessary and effective? Do we know, for example, if radial trenching treatment would be more effective at remediation of a compacted urban soil in comparison to an air tillage treatment? Tree responses may tell us this, but this is indirect and often not immediate. We should be measuring the soil properties directly to see if we are indeed addressing the site-specific problem. Now let's talk a bit on how to assess soils. I will be using this graphic to discuss soil assessment. The, tri the triangle represents the broad functions that soils perform. The circles and Venn diagram in the middle represent the soil properties we might use as indicators of soil quality. Soil quality assessment includes five steps. We must define soil functions, select and measure indicators, and compute and utilize the soil quality score. Defining the specific soil function is step one. Soils perform many important functions, such as supporting plants, protecting the environment, and supporting human health. For a proper soil quality assessment, it is necessary to be as specific as possible on the exact function you're concerned with. Urban soils perform a variety of functions. The indicators we use vary by each of these functions. For example, if the function is stormwater abatement, retention, and cleaning, as it is in this parking lot, water infiltration and storage might be what we should measure to evaluate soil quality. Conversely, if the function is growing food in an urban soil, the assessment properties will differ. In this urban garden, we might be concerned with contaminants and we would want to focus on cation exchange capacity or maybe some specific contaminant like lead. Today we are talking about urban trees, so we will focus on the soil properties that are important for urban tree health. 
Focusing in on this specific function will allow us to select the appropriate indicators that will tell us the most about the soil's ability to support those healthy urban trees. Indicator selection is the next step in soil quality assessment. We will start by considering which indicators we might measure for the function of supporting healthy urban trees. Referring back to my diagram, I'm now going to discuss what exactly is contained in the bubbles. We have many soil properties that we could potentially measure. How do we decide which ones to measure? We should consider the characteristics for ideal soil quality indicators for urban trees. I feel that ideal soil indicators should meet these five criteria. First, they should integrate soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. They need to be closely tied to the function of supporting urban trees. The indicators should be responsive to any management actions we might perform. Indicators that are accessible to users are preferred, and we prefer field-based measurements that, be that can be conducted by practitioners. Lastly, it is ideal if we have a good background information on the specific indicator. This will help us interpret the measurements. Which physical, chemical, and biological properties should we measure? We have been conducting research on these indicators for the past decade or so. I will briefly discuss some of this research. Back in 2012, we published a paper in Arboriculture and Urban Forestry that established a minimum data set to create an urban soil quality index. The study examined about 70 physical, chemical, and biological soil properties to find out which soil properties were most indicative of urban tree health. From those properties, we created an urban soil quality index. The urban soil quality index was found to correlate with urban tree health. The soil properties with the index were soil texture, soil bulk density, aggregate stability, pH, electrical conductivity, total organic matter, and labile organic matter. We took that information and developed a more comprehensive field-based model to assess urban site quality. The RUSI model, or Rapid Urban Site Index, we created included nine soil quality attributes as well as some climate and urban factors to help us predict site quality for urban trees. I don't have time to talk about the details of this model today or of this study, but if you're interested, you can read the paper or contact me to discuss this further. We did find a reasonable and significant correlation with the RUSI model and ur urban tree health in five different US cities that we tested the model in. We also found that the RUSI model was robust enough to correlate with urban tree health with different urban tree species. From these two studies and some ongoing work, we're fairly confident that some of the most important soil quality indicators for healthy urban trees are soil texture, structure, pH, salt, and organic matter. We will come back to these five indicators in a few moments. I would now like to say a few words on how we measure each of these indicators. It is important to consider where, when, and how we should measure the indicators. Let's start with exactly, let's start with, with where, or exactly where we might measure, make the measurements to perform a soil quality assessment. Since we are dealing with urban trees, the X and Y sample dimensions might be defined by the drip line, or I like to recommend the extended drip line. I feel it's often a good idea to also sample where you would envision the roots would grow when a tree is at maturity, which is the extended drip line. Urban landscapes are very diverse. It is a good idea to stratify landscapes into sample blocks. These sample blocks might be defined by unique species groups, management blocks, or other factors. If you have problem sites, it's a really good idea to sample in that site and also sample in adjacent high quality sites. This strategy might help you detect some specific important differences. The Z dimension or soil depth is often neglected in soil assessment. 
what depth should we sample? In the BMP, we suggest to sample where the roots are. And again, I recommend you consider where you would like them to grow. This may involve sampling the surface or a horizon or may involve sampling deeper. We must remember that soils are often not uniform with depth. The soil profile shows multiple fills and combustion products that have been densified. The upper 40 centimeters is a relatively high quality soil, but it overlies some very low quality soil. The discontinuity might have a severe impact on water movement, root distribution, and other soil properties. We need to be aware that soil assessment might require a deeper investigation. Had we only sampled the upper six to eight inches of this soil profile, we would be missing the real limiting feature of the site. When should we measure indicators is another consideration. Some soil properties are dynamic and change very quickly. Others are relatively static and do not change. It is my suggestion that dynamic soil properties such as nutrients should always be measured during the growing season. Static properties such as soil texture can be measured throughout the year. Soil assessment involves repeated sampling. It is rare that a one-time sampling will suffice. If we are going to performing some specific action on a site, it is important that we perform baseline sampling prior to that action. And then follow up those specific management actions with the exact same soil assessment measurements. We must do this to examine whether the actions are effective. I will now discuss some expertise and tools required for some of these assessments. The BMP gives guidance on soil sampling, but I'd like to cover some of the highlights from the BMP. Here are some common hand tools that we might use for sampling soils. The shovel is my favorite. I can go as deep as needed with this tool, but it does make quite a mess. The bucket auger on the far left and Dutch auger in the center are a bit cleaner and also allow for some deeper soil sampling. The push probes are designed for repeated sampling of surface soils and are generally best used for fertility assessments. We also have some specialized equipment like high pressure air tools. These are great for amending soils and doing diagnostic investigations. Regardless of the tool, it is critical that we get a good look at the soil. Most of the critical soil properties that I'm going to discuss next will require some interpretation and context. Sometimes if we really want to understand what is going on below ground, we actually need to get below ground. Soil pits are the best way to do this, although they are quite messy. An investigation soil pit does not have to be anywhere near as big as this pit that we use for an educational event. We can typically get to the root of most soil problems with about a cubic meter soil pit or a one meter by one meter by one meter deep soil pit. Now let's talk how we measure these five critical indicators. Soil texture is the composition of the individual soil separates. Soil texture is critical and tells us about water and nutrient holding. Soil texture tells us the amounts of sand, silt, and clay. Sand is our biggest soil separate and clay is our smallest. We give the texture a name based on the relative proportions of these three separates. We know a tremendous amount of information about the soil with only this texture class name. We can accurately estimate soil texture class by using the fuel method. This method involves trying to make a soil into a ball and then assessing whether or not we can make a ribbon and how long that ribbon is. Lastly, we will feel for grittiness, stickiness, or smoothness of the sample. Soils that do not form balls are sand textured. 
soils that form balls, but not ribbons, are loamy sands or silts. Next, we want to look at the size of the ribbons. The soils with ribbons that are less than one inch are loams. Soils with ribbons that are one to two inches in length are clay loams, and soils with ribbons that are greater than two inches are clays. The modifiers of sand and silt are then applied to those textures with ribbons that feel gritty or smooth. And if it feels neither gritty nor smooth, typically will be sticky and it will be found in the middle of this diagram. Soil structure is the shape and arrangement of soil aggregates and pore spaces. Soil structure can tell us about compaction, aeration, water movement, biological activity, and many other soil properties. Soil structure type is assessed by describing the shape and also the strength of the aggregates. Granular soil structure is ideal because it has lots of pore spaces between small rounded aggregates. It is indicative of a soil that is well-drained and has high biological activity. Platy soil structure is not a desirable soil structure type. The soil has platy structure due to compaction. This soil would have poor drainage and also low biological activity. The soil may also be very susceptible to erosion. Massive soil structure means that the soil does not have structure. And when sampled, the stro soil structural units come out in large chunks from the sampling tool. Massive is also not a desirable soil structure and is commonly found with compaction. Soils can also be without structure. This structureless single grain soil has very low biological activity, also very low clay content, and consequently does not have any aggregates. The strength of aggregation can also be quickly assessed. The soil on the left has well-defined strong blocky structure. The soil on the right has weak structure. Stronger aggregates are ideal as they provide, provide aeration and would be most resistant to damage from compaction or other disturbances. One easy way to assess aggregate strength is to submerse the aggregates in water and see if they fall apart. Both of these soils have granular soil structure, but the soil on the left has more organic matter, stronger aggregates, and a higher percentage of water stable aggregates. In comparison, when the, when the aggregates from the soil on the right were submerged, they quickly fell apart. The soil on the left is a higher quality soil and is less erodible. We might also quantitatively assess soil structure by measuring soil bulk density. Bulk density is the dry mass of soil per some volume. It is often measured with a sampler that allows you to take an intact core of the soil. The soil is then extracted, dried, and weighed. High bulk density values indicate denser soils that might be compacted. Another method for assessing soil structure and, may, and maybe compaction is to use a penetrometer. A penetrometer, penetrometer measures the force required to push through soil. 
this cone penetrometer is pushed through the soil. And when the cone hits a dense layer, more force is required to move through that dense layer. These cone penetrometers do come with some additional cost and also require some interpretation. Cone penetrometer resistance varies with soil moisture content and also soil texture. So it is important to know your moisture contents and your soil textures when trying to interpret the values from these instruments. Soil pH is a chemical property that relates the acidity or alkalinity of the soil. It is a very important determinant of elements that nutrients and contaminants and their availability, and it can also impact microbial processes in soil. Soil pH can easily and accurately be measured in the field with relatively inexpensive probes or even indicator kits, such as the Helig Trug kit shown here. Another important chemical property is soil salinity. Dissolved salts in soil may be problematic due to toxicity effects on plants. They may alter the soil osmotic potential and may even create losses of soil structure. One relatively practical means to assess soil salinity is to measure the soil electrical conductivity. Electrical currents will be transmitted faster in soils with higher salt contents. So soils with higher electrical conductivity readings may indicate potential salinity problems. Soil electrical, conduct electrical conductivity can be measured with relatively inexpensive and accurate probes, such as the one shown here. This probe is a combination electrical conductivity and pH probe. So a probe like this could be used to perform both a pH and an electrical conductivity measurement. The last soil property that I'll briefly discuss is soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is carbon-based material in the soil, aside from inorganic carbon. Soil organic matter is a critical soil property that affects most every other physical, chemical, and biological soil property. Soil organic matter impacts water, nutrients, contaminants, their availability, and their retention. It has a role in soil structure. It is the substrate for microorganisms, and it is the base of the soil food web. It is typically one of the more dynamic soil properties that might be impacted by disturbance and when measured might provide an early indication of soil recovery from that disturbance. It may be our most important indicator of soil quality that we can measure. There are many different ways to assess soil organic matter and many of them require intensive laboratory work. Estimation of soil organic matter with soil color is the most appropriate for soil quality assessment due to its practicality. This is the Munsell color book, which is how a soil scientist describes the color of the soil. Each page in the book is, represents a specific hue or the general wavelength. The page you're looking at here is a 7.5 YR or 7.5 yellow red hue. The chromas on the X axis show how pure or vibrant a hue can be. The values on the Y axis show the lightness or darkness. Soil organic matter tends to correlate with the value and lower soil values indicate higher soil organic matter contents. So looking at this page, we would expect to see 
soils with higher organic matter contents having soil values lower on the page. Soils with values of three or less tend to have soil organic matter contents often above 5% or so. Conversely, soils with low soil organic matter contents, less than 2% or so, might have soil color values greater than five. Practitioners have been utilizing soil color for quite some time to estimate soil organic matter. This color chart is specific for Illinois agricultural soils, and these soils have a limited range of hues. Hence, this soil color chart works quite well for predicting the organic matter content of those specific soils. The selected color chips correlate with specific soil organic matter contents, which have been verified with laboratory data. Unfortunately, we don't currently have a chart like this for use in urban soils. Fortunately, our lab is currently working on this problem. We are testing a variety of sensors that might be used to predict soil organic matter with color. Some of these instruments are quite expensive, but they're also very accurate, such as the chromometer on the far right of this slide. Some of these instruments are quite cheap and also might be accurate enough such as the NICS color sensor in the middle of the chart of the slide. Ultimately, what we are hoping to make is that we can develop an app that might do the job as a soil organic matter screening tool in which you would simply be able to pull up the app, take a picture of the soil, and that would return a soil organic matter content with some ranges. Color is my favorite soil property, and it is a great one to tell us about soil quality. As I mentioned, it gives us a lot of information about potential organic matter contents, but it tells us a whole bunch of other things about the soil. The soil this soil shown here is quite wet, and in portions, anaerobic. And we can easily determine that by looking at the color. The gray areas in this soil represent areas of iron depletion, and those are anaerobic zones. Those reddish areas in the soil, also identified by looking simply at its color, are areas in which we would identify those as aerobic zones and iron concentrations. That was a very quick overview of some of the critical soil properties. It is important to remember that there are many soil properties to measure and each situation might require a unique set of those properties. This list is a great starting point, but you might have to tailor it to the landscapes that you manage. The next thing I would like to discuss today is how we can utilize these soil properties to rate soil quality and provide a soil quality score. To do this, we need to first determine a score for each of the properties that we have selected for indicators. We then would look at each of those individual properties and determine a weight based on its perceived importance. The overall score is then computed and this is typically referred to as our soil quality index. The score for a soil property is determined by identifying what values are ideal and what values are limiting for urban trees. For example, ideal soil color values, which tell us about organic matter, might be lower than three. Conversely, higher values might indicate less organic matter and would then be given a lower score. Scores allow us to normalize and standardize multiple soil properties onto one scale. 
scale for this example ranges from zero to one, with one being the highest for soil quality for our function of urban tree health. Ideal and limiting ranges for these soil properties and many others are listed in the BMP. This data was summarized from available literature and also expert knowledge. Data like this is necessary to create proper scoring functions so we can use the scores to create these soil quality indicators. Applying weights to, the, to properties is also very useful. Since these properties do not typically have equal importance on soil quality. For example, a particular situation might deem that soil organic matter is more important for urban tree health than soil pH. A soil quality index is then computed by taking the score and weight for each property and multiplying them and summing up for a total. The last step in soil quality assessment is to appropriately utilize the score. What I mean by this is that how do we apply the soil quality index for the specific function of supporting urban trees, healthy urban trees? I will give you some examples of cases in which we could utilize and interpret a soil quality index. No two roadside planting sites are the same. Maybe we want to determine which of these roadside planting sites is high and which is of low quality. The soil quality index could be employed to do so. That information could then be applied for more informative urban forest planning to meet right species in the right site goals. Many urban sites are degraded. For example, topsoils are often removed and subsoils compacted to prepare sites for infrastructure. The soil quality index could be applied to relatively rank how severe this disturbance is. The soil quality index could also be applied to relatively rank different soil amendment actions to remediate that compacted soil. For example, is a wood chip mulch more effective at fixing that compacted soil compared to a compost top dressing? I would like to wrap up and recap the whole soil quality assessment process with a specific example. The example I will discuss is from a subdivision near Chicago, Illinois. Site quality is variable in this subdivision. Some of the sites are very degraded and some of the trees are in severe decline and many of the trees has actually died and been needed to be replaced on the site. Compaction and replacement of topsoil appear to be some of the major drivers of site quality differences. Soil B on the right is from an area that was severely compacted. And we know this because we can see it has massive soil structure. We also can see that the soil B on the right is a poor quality because the A horizon is about half the depth, only extending to about a depth of about 10 centimeters. And we can see that by the difference in soil color. Conversely, soil A is not compacted, has granular structure, and an A horizon depth of greater than 20 centimeters. We developed a soil quality index to rate all the planting sites in this subdivision. The soil quality index included three properties in which we went out in the field, measured, then scored, and each of these three properties we weighted differently. The indicators in the soil quality index were selected to best distinguish the planting sites. 
So as I mentioned on this particular site, it was the organic matter or the depth of the topsoil, the degree of compaction that, had, that seemed to vary. And we also had a suspicion that pH differences might be important on this site. So we decided that in our index, we would include organic matter content, pH, and the degree of compaction. And these would be the most appropriate physical, chemical, biological properties to assess soil quality in this subdivision. We decided that compaction was most likely the most important limiting feature, followed by the depth of the organic matter, and lastly, soil pH. So we weighted the compaction having half of the importance of our, our, our index, and 30% and 20% for organic matter and pH appropriate. Scoring functions were created for each of these three properties. We stated that more organic matter is ideal. We stated that a pH of six to seven is ideal. And we stated that higher penetration resistant measurements indicate higher compaction and these are less ideal. Each of these three properties were assessed in the field and scored with those scoring functions. The scores were then multiplied by the weights and summed for overall index. For example, soil organic matter of soil A was 3%, which was scored a 0 0.8 multiplied by the weight of 0.3 for a score of 0 0.24. Soil B was much more compacted and had a 800 PSI pounds per square inch penetration resistance reading, which was scored as 0.1 with a weighted score of 0.05. The soil quality index for each of these planting sites was determined by this method. Soil A received an overall score of 0.74, soil B of 0.27. The scores for each site were then mapped. We can use this map to make better planting decisions. We can see areas of relatively higher soil quality that we should put our weaker trees in. We can also see areas of relatively lower soil quality that we might target for our tougher trees and or we might target those areas of lower soil quality with some corrective soil management actions, which would then be followed up with further assessment to see if those actions were effective. I hope that you can see that soil quality assessment is a powerful tool that can and should be utilized for soil, soil management for urban trees. Here's a list of the papers that are referred to in this talk. I'm happy to share a PDF of the second two paper, research papers. The BMP can be purchased through the website of the International Society of Aboriculture. And I believe I've saved enough time to have um, time for questions now. Sure. Uh, so Brian, I don't know if you can see the question and answer panel anymore, but there were a couple of questions about the importance of pH. Uh, when it comes to soil nut nutrient availability um, and possible ways to increase or decrease pH? Sure. So, so soil pH is really important for nutrient availability. And we also get, must, need to remember that it's also important for availability of other elements like contaminants. Um, and, and we know that certain nutrients become more or less available as pH varies. And we think that pH six to seven is ideal because the vast majority of our macro and our micronutrients are available at that pH range. If we go to more acidic end, um, certain nutrients become tied up or unavailable to plants. Likewise, if we go to more the alkaline end, certain nutrients become tied up as well too. Oftentimes these are the micronutrients, but they're still important. So we can, we can 
and, and pH is, is, is long been a focus of soil management, not only in arboriculture settings, but in agriculture settings and modification is, is something that we commonly are doing for, for these soils. Uh, there, there are certainly things that we can do for both an alkaline and an acidic soil. So, and, and, and I guess I could talk a little bit about that and I, and I guess I will in a, in a minute, but I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna preface it by saying that my number one recommendation is to consider this right site for right species. We do know that certain trees also can tolerate different pH ranges. So if you're dealing with an alkaline site, put a species in there that we know can deal with that alkaline site, okay? Um, that's that's the first and the first and foremost what you want to do. And, and the reason why I, I say that is because urban soils tend to be more on the alkaline side, and many urban soils tend to have pretty high buffering capacities. So that means that we might go in there and modify pH, but the soil is well buffered. So that means that the pH is going to change back to what it originally started as, and it has a high buffering capacity because it have a, might have a lot of clay or a particular type of clay. And, and, and it's gonna just move back to that original pH. And pH is the balance between protons and hydroxyls. And if we have a huge supply of protons or a huge supply of hydroxyls, um, it's just a really difficult thing to try and manipulate. Okay, so, so then so certain things that we can apply to try and modify pH. I think I'll just talk about alkaline soils because that's most commonly what we're dealing with in urban areas. Um, so any agent that we can apply to the soil to acidify it, okay? And we shouldn't forget about natural acidification products. And some of these natural acidification products are things like organic materials or facilitating or stimulating decomposition and microbial activity. Because what happens when microbes are active is they're breathing and they're releasing CO2. That CO2 reacts with water and that produces a weak acid, which is gonna to work to drive down that pH. And you're gonna be more successful in modifying pH over the long term, although it's gonna take a longer time to do this, but it's gonna be a more permanent modification, okay? There are chemical things that we can put in soils to acidify them more immediately like sulfur products. And there's lots and lots of extension publications that will give you some specific recommendations based on the pH, the soil texture, how much sulfur you might need to add to drop it to its desired range. And we talk a little bit about that in the BMP as well too. So rather than trying to give you a pounds per square foot, which I don't wanna do, they'll refer you to those recommendations or you have my email address. And if you give me some more background information, I'm happy to write a prescription for you. So that was a, a long-winded answer, but I don't know <laughs> how much detail you want. Um, I think that I think that got to the, the simplification of it, at least as far as you can go. Um, okay. The other another thing that got brought up a couple of times was biochar. Um, there was one person who asked about the using uncharred biochar and what the effects of that are. Um, and then another person talked asked about the color, the Munsell color book, how biochar would impact the color book uh, assessment. Yeah, great. So, so this talk was all about soil assessment and, and it was intentional because I, I do think that, that folks in our industry focus so much on how we fix problems that we don't talk about, you know, what the problem is and, how, and if, if our actions are, 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 are actually working. Um, but in regards to that management or some of the things that we can do to try and fix some of these problems, biochar is certainly one of these things that people are, have been applying to urban soils in an attempt to, to fix them. And it's one thing that we've been looking at in our research as well, too. So if you're not familiar, biochar is just a fancy word that we use for a charcoal-like product that has a certain amount of carbon in it that we apply to soil. And one of the, re or there's, there's some reasons why folks have found it to be effective um, as a soil amendment, because one of them being that it has a high charge capacity. So it has lots and lots of um, exchange sites to hold on to nutrients. It also has a relatively high water holding capacity. Biochars also tend to be 
relatively inert compared to other organic products like a compost. So that means that it's not going to break down as fast as a compost. So we think that maybe you'll, you'll retain more carbon in the soil for a longer period of time. And then I think the third major thing that folks have been finding with biochar is that it's a really ideal substrate for microorganisms. So it provides a nice home for microorganisms. Okay. Um, so in terms of the, the, the efficacy or, or how, how, how well it's worked, it does work in certain situations and certain types of biochars. Okay, so what we found in our research, first off, you need to be starting with woody feedstock biochar. So that means biochar is from woody materials and, you, and that, that tends to work better than like a biochar from um, something that's not as solid and it relates to the cellular structure and, and the exchange sites. Um, we also found that biochars that are, are made at really high pyrolysis temperatures or the temperature that we, we, we essentially burn the material, not really burn it, um, but the temperatures that we make the materials at, if those are really high, we lose a lot of that, combar that carbon and that exchange capacity. So we like to have our biochars less than 500 degrees Celsius. And then the third thing that kind of dictates whether or not the biochar might be effective is what we do to it afterwards. So are we mixing it with something? So one thing that's important to consider with biochar is it's not a fertilizer. So if you're looking to get nitrogen or phosphorus, biochars might be effective at holding that, that nitrogen or phosphorus there, but it's not going to be a supply of it. So our most effective treatments for soil remediation, if, if we're looking in, in terms of a biochar treatment, often involve some sort of mixing of another organic product like a compost or an inorganic fertilizer with it. And we have some found some positive results in soil quality and tree health and growth, but it's only been on very degraded sites. So sites, and, and oftentimes we find our best results on very degraded sandy sites. So stuff where there's no organic supply at all in, okay? So it has some limitations and it has potential to work in some sites. Was that vague enough to... <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but, and, and we published a, quite a, few, uh, a couple papers on this topic. Um, so I'm happy to, to talk more in detail or share papers with, with, with the person that asked that question. Perfect. I'm just going to interject really quick and say I'm going to launch a poll. So if you guys wouldn't mind just taking um, the poll really quick and um, I'll leave it up. If you want to move it off your screen so you can see um, Brian's email address, go ahead and do that. But uh, if you wouldn't mind taking the poll before you leave the meeting room, that would be much appreciated. All right. Uh, Brian, could you go into a little bit more depth about organic carbon versus inorganic carbon in soils, giving examples of both? Sure. So organic carbon is derived from anything that was once living or currently living. Okay. Inorganic carbon would be something um, typically, if, if you think of like a, a calcium carbonate, okay, uh, or a limestone or, or dolomite. So it, that stuff also pro was once living as well too, but we're talking like geologic time versus pedogenic or soil time. Okay. Got it. And then as far as the Munsell color book goes, is it applicable across the entire globe or are, they, are there local specific ones that people need to look for? So the Munsell color book is used across the globe and it's a great system that soil scientists commu can communicate soil colors um, with. It, it is, it's probably not as appropriate for a boriculture because we don't really have the relationships defined yet, um, meaning that we don't know a 10YR43, what that organic matter level is in an urban soil. And one of the questions you brought up before about um, biochar and color. So one thing that we have to deal with it in urban soils is that we have, we can potentially have all these other sorts of urban organic contaminants like black carbon or combustion products. So they're gonna put a wonky color on soils. And, and if we're using color to investigate the organic matter levels, well, then we're gonna to have to have some unique predictive relationships, which is why we're trying to do develop these relationships specifically for urban soils. 
And we hope to have something within the next year or two uh, uh, on, on that work. But if anyone's interested, so, so one thing that I, they often do with, with practitioners is work on site assessment for their specific landscapes. So anybody can develop their own organic matter um, color prediction chart. You just need about 20, 30 representative soils. And then you send them off to a laboratory, you run your organic matter contents, and then you pick up a color book and you, you determine the color the, the corresponding color chips. And then you do a simple regression and you can use, then you can util, utilize that regression for your soils. And it works quite well for your limited range of hues. And I'm happy to work with any practitioners that want to do that. Okay, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple, straightforward thing that, that you could get a lot of information um, with relatively minimal effort, I think. Gotcha. Um, and then a couple other questions that came up were in relationship to um, soil volume and the bulk density, looking at you know what what's too high, what's too low, um, and also in conjunction with that, at least I think would be organic matter. What would be you know too low of a percentage and too high of a percentage? Is there too much organic matter possible? <laughs> Yep. So, so thresholds are really important, and that's the scoring functions I referred to. I'm so, uh, and and this is really the interpretation for the things that we measure in the field. So, is this a good value? Is this a bad value? Is it a limiting value? Um, so, bulk density and organic matter. I could talk specifically about those. So, bulk density is a little tricky one because our it varies with soil texture. So sandy soils or soils like sands, loamy sands, sandy loams are inherently going to have higher soil bulk densities just based on the weight or the mass of those separates that contain. Compared to a loam or a clay soil, which will inherently have a lower soil bulk density. So the, the root limiting threshold for soil bulk density varies by soil texture. So in the BMP, we superimposed um, limiting thresholds across the soil texture triangle. But some numbers that you want to keep in the back of your mind or in terms of limiting thresholds, if I'm looking at a loamy type soil, so something in the mid middle of the texture triangle, a 1.6 grams per cubic centimeter might be a value that might be a root limiting threshold. If I'm looking at a clay soil, so maybe that value drops to about a 1.5 as a root limiting threshold. A sandy soil, the value might increase a little bit to maybe like a 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so those root limiting thresholds vary by soil texture, which is why you need to know the soil texture. One of the reasons you need to know the soil texture as well too. Okay, um, organic matter levels in terms of thresholds and ideal values, I'd say a threshold if I was managing for trees in the urban environment, which we often do, I would want to have organic matter levels greater than 2% or so, because then you're going to have typical good fertility, um, or, or not, you're going to, you're not going to, your, your fertility might not be as limited. If you get below that 2% into the 1% range, you might have problems with nutrient availability. You might have problems with water retention. Okay. The other thing you need to consider though is the depth of those organic materials. So I could have an A horizon that is two centimeters that has 10% organic matter, okay? And I could have a similar site in which my A horizon is 3% organic matter but extends down to 25 centimeters, okay? So the depth and the amount of their organic matter is an important thing to consider. But if I, if I had A horizons that are in excess of 10 centimeters and organic matter contents greater than two three percent. That's something that that would identify as maybe a threshold that I want to be above, and I wouldn't want to go above six seven eight percent organic matter. And the reason why is because then you might get problems with subsidence, oxidation, because we also use these substrates um, for things like you know bearing surfaces for pavements and roads and things like that. And we don't. We don't like to have a lot of changes in the elevation on these things, right? Right. Cool. Okay. And then uh, a bunch of people asked about uh, feasibility and if you think it's a good idea to amend soils for new plantings on, you know, new urbanized areas. 
Well, I, I'm not sure I can answer that without, I mean, you need context. This, I mean, the whole point sure. of what I was trying to make today is you, you certainly can, but should you, that's where the assessment comes in. So if, if you perform some assessment, you see some sort of limiting feature that you can tackle with a particular amendment, then, then yes, possibly. And then you could follow up with another assessment to make sure it works. So, <laughs> sorry. Okay. No, nope, that's fine. Um, I think that's the bulk of the question. There were some. We other have ones. we have like seventy more questions, Brian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is like condent all uh, all of this information is um, available, and so uh, I'll record it, and so I'll just grab all of the questions. And if you if there's something that pops out that you're like, man, I wish I could have addressed that. What I can do is, um, you if you wanted to type out like a paragraph answer or something with some links or whatever that might make sense, I can send out that to all the registrants. So we had over like 1200 people register for today's webinar. And so sometimes when we have really big um, webinars like that, I like to send out an email to everybody and say like, hey, here's the recording. Here's Brian's email address, you know, just kind of checking in with folks. So if something pops out in these 76 questions that didn't get answered, um, <laughs> maybe something will, uh, you know, maybe your question will get selected and we can answer that for you. Otherwise, um, Brian's emails there and um, this webinar was recorded and um, streamed live on YouTube so that you can go watch that recording right now um, if you want to re-watch re it and um, it's available for everybody and um, I just want to reach out and say thank you Brian thank you Teresa thank you Monica for um, helping put this webinar together I really appreciate it and I mean clearly we had a huge response because this is a really important topic and somebody um, chimed in and said maybe we need to do sort of a part two. So I think that's food for thought um, anyways and just really appreciate everybody for joining us today for our first webinar of the new year. So signing off from Nevada and um, hopefully everybody has a wonderful day wherever you are. Okay, thank you. And if there's enough interest, I'd be happy to do um, a part two on specific management actions. I think that would be, I think, a, you know, I think people are kind of, Brian, I think people are kind of hungry for that as far as yeah. a more in depth. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we might get a smaller turnout, but also just more like uh, uh, more in being, having the ability to go further in depth, I think really provides a big value for our audience. And I think that's a great idea. So let's stay in touch. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye everybody. Have a good day. Bye.